pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for your interest of coming. Um, um, you might maybe two questions before I start um, that you might have is like um, one is um, was already in a way answered by Alessandro the the relevance of this uh, what I'm going to show you like uh, why we, why should you look at the Western Sahara it's so far away um, but uh, as Alessandro <laughs> said um, I think there are certain kind of comparisons to be made there is a certain kind of um, um, similarities that we should discuss, can discuss later. Um, and uh, why I was looking at the, uh, this case study is because I think it's an extremely interesting uh, example that allows us to, um, to see this concept or the, the phenomena uh, and the reality of the camp from a different perspective that uh, shows us that at least what the West, what the Europe, what America, what, what in the Western world is, is perceived to be a refugee camp um, can take on a radically different form. Um, and and um, not so much in its physical reality, but in how the camp is, is being used by the refugees themselves, by its population. So, and uh, allow me to um, uh, make a little bit of a historical introduction almost every country has become independent. And the largest um, country that you still see, Palestine is too small. Very uh, <laughs> the, the resolution of the Beamer is, is um, otherwise we would see it, no. The largest red country that you still uh, see is the Western Sahara. Um, it sits on the western edge of the African continent, just where the Sahara meets the Atlantic Ocean. And um, it's, uh, let's say, the la last largest or the largest last colonial country still existing today. This territory became and turned into a Spanish colony in the late, 19, uh, in the late 1800s. Um, this is connected both um, to the general kind of period of colonization of Africa, the so-called scramble of Africa in 18. 84, uh, where basically all of Africa was divided amongst the great European powers, England, Germany, France, Portugal, um, Belgium, and also Spain. Uh, they sat down in Berlin at a Berlin, so-called Berlin Conference and kind of divided up the African continent, grabbed uh, um, um, kind of all the territories as colonies, but it's also connected in this specific case to, let's say, the demise, uh, the downfall of Spain as a grand empire. Uh, so the economic, let's say, uh, benefits, at least at that time in the late 19th century, seemed very uh, meager, seemed very limited. Um, this turn, this changed uh, at the moment. It got um, occupied by a Spanish uh, soldiers by Spanish military troops. So now we have the situation today still is that uh, three quarters of the country is occupied by Morocco. Um, um, the Sahrawis uh, uh, established refugee camps about 50 kilometers into Algeria, close to the city of, of Tindouf, um, and uh, have lived in these refugee camps ever since for now more than uh, 35 years. What is important, though, uh, to say is that in all of these camps, UNHCR, UNRWA was not involved. Uh, even Algeria was involved only as a provider of material. All the camps were established by the refugees themselves with the planning, with the uh, logistics um, and, and the, <coughs> the administration. Uh, by the refugees themselves without international organizations overseeing this. UNHCR only moved in uh, about uh, 15 years ago. This is uh, the earliest photograph that we have of the camps. Uh, they look like we think camps look. Uh, rows of tents. Um, this transformed very, very quickly to um, other tents. Um, and then uh, later to um, clay houses um, or clay huts. Um, what is particular about uh, the situation of the Western Sahara is that um, it was an ongoing 
guerrilla war with the Moroccans, the men were fighting and the women were uh, organizing uh, and setting up the camps. So um, uh, the women played a crucial role in um, not only administrating uh, the camps, but really building them up uh, from, from scratch. Um, and if we start to look at the camps, the first thing that we notice is, of course, the, let's say, the way the refugees live. Uh, and if we um, look over this kind of scenery that we have here, we see already quite a big range of, a relatively big range, let's say, of, of housing. Uh, we see um, uh, huts constructed out of clay bricks. We see huts which are plastered. And we see tents. And if we um, look more closely, we see more, maybe a more bigger range of, of uh, uh, residential um, uh, typologies. We always see the tent, um, but we also see metal huts. Um, we see uh, the tent in different shades of brown dust and sand. Um, we see um, huts, we see um, unclustered huts, we see metal huts, we see um, whole clusters of, of buildings. Um, and if we observe more um, kind of precisely what we can see is that the refugees live obviously in uh, residential compounds. Sometimes um, they occupy just one clay hut or a tent, but in most cases um, they have used the time to build up their kind of residential compounds, which this is quite generous but quite uh, typical on the other hand. It consists of four uh, huts plus a tent and it's all kind of embraced um, by a wall uh, to really enclose an inner courtyard. Every hut has, has one function, every function has one hut, so the kitchen, the tea room, the sleeping room, um, and so on, um, plus the tent. Um, why does the tent still figure so predominantly in this uh, image? First of all, there is um, kind of um, practical reasons. You have an extremely hot climate. In the summer, the tent is more comfortable uh, because uh, it, um, in the summer nights it cools down quicker um, uh, when uh, the clay huts stay hotter in the night, uh, whereas in the winter uh, the clay hut is more comfortable because it doesn't cool down so much. What is it happening now is it's quite interesting. There's first of all the profession of the architect appearing in the camp. So there's someone who's professionally designing uh, these um, refugee um, uh, housing. Um, uh, again, there's this dilemma of is it allowed to become an architect in a refugee camp, being a refugee yourself, um, building something which is meant to be there only um, uh, temporarily. I think what the uh, refugee camps of the Western Sahara provide us uh, is a incredibly interesting <coughs> precedent, uh, a model, uh, a case study of a camp which is unlike any of these three kind of readings or understandings of the camp, but where uh, the camp is used as a tool itself to practice running a state, to practice running a nation before uh, the refugees will have access again to their homeland, where all the institutions um, like the um, funky uh, defense uh, ministry are set up um, and, and are installed and are kind of <coughs> practiced to, to um, administer a population in exile. Um, and uh, all this infrastructure and institutions can then be carried home to uh, the Western Sahara if the possibility arises. So in that sense, um, the title of the lecture, uh, that this camps kind of prefigure uh, the creation of the, of the nation. That's the mayor of one of the camps, and this was my kind of research team. I asked this um, uh, mayor whether he would, whether we, he would, uh, <laughs> whether he would accept the term um, city for the camp, whether he would ever allow um, uh, the camp to be called urban, or 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 if it would be uh, um, acceptable to use the word city for the camp. And he almost got upset. Yeah. Absolutely not. No, we have no roads, we have no power lines, we have no um, concrete houses. Um, it misses anything from that a city has. And uh, even though I think that 
this answer was partially kind of motivated politically that if this camp would be called a city, then it would also accept a kind of permanence. I think what the refugees have managed is to create a place, whether we call it city or not, is, is maybe not important, but which carries all the qualities of, or most of the qualities of urbanity without um, needing to be permanent. It carries the kind of the conditions of urbanity, the density, the heterogeneity, the exchange, the, uh, the kind of the, um, uh, the possibility to, to communicate, um, to educate, to, um, uh, to, to learn and so on. Uh, without um, needing to be permanent, uh, having the ability to move them uh, somewhere else if the possibility arises. The camps were used as a kind of an engine in a way of emancipation, not only for the role of the women, uh, but also for the role of the women, but also as a society as a whole, moving from a nomadic and very tribal-based society to a kind of, let's say, modern-based society where it's more the relationship of families between each other and not of tribes between each other. And um, so again, having kind of created this, uh, let's say, normality within a, a quasi-normal life, within a very unnormal uh, situation. We see carpets, we see um, cloth, we see textiles. And again, we can say this is a kind of a reference to the nomadic culture and it's a reference to a local culture and the uh, culture of craft. But again, there's this idea of temporality or anything that you can see here can be dismantled, can be dismounted very, very quickly, can be put on the back of the jeep or the back of the camel and, and uh, taken away. Uh, so there is a kind of an element of temporality, of flexibility, of, of, of something that can be, that is not permanent. Every camp has its own personality somehow. If a camp could have a personality, then, then they would have different personalities. I close with two kind of additional observations. One is this idea of, I just come back to uh, this idea of temporary uh, versus permanence. It plays out through all the kind of aspects of life, not only the residential. In a way, instead of building um, asphalt road, uh, you invest into a four-wheel drive. Um, um, instead of uh, investing into uh, water lines, um, you um, have these water kind of canisters, uh, containers, where you have uh, the potable, the drinking water. <coughs> and in, instead of investing into power lines, uh, you have uh, the transportable. So this, this, in a way, it has almost become an architectural language of um, temporariness. Um, uh, it has almost become a kind of design issue uh, or, or aesthetic um, dimension. Uh, but on the other hand, there is this constant struggle uh, which is seen in the background of this designed house. Um, a second observation can be seen in this, um, in this uh, name of the ministry. It's called the Ministry of Public Health. And even though I'm, I'm completely aware that the term public health is a technical term um, of kind of the health of a um, uh, pop population of um, uh, let's just borrow this term public and ask the question whether the notion of the public is possible in a refugee camp where usually um, unlike here usually a, a refugee camp is controlled by someone else but publicness depends on common ownership so here we have a very ambiguous situation of a camp where, um, which rules itself, governs itself, where everything kind of belongs to each other, but the ground itself is not owned. Uh, the territory belongs in the end still to Algeria. So um, I think it's worthwhile discussing this idea of publicness in the camp. I think we have to ask whether it is not exactly the camps which play a role in preventing the, uh, the political conflict to be resolved whether the camps not even play a little role in, in preventing um, the occupation of Morocco to end. Uh, because no refugee is dying anymore, um, no, um, uh, uh, the war has ended, no one is suffering, uh, whether instead of solving the occupation of the uh, Western Sahara politically, it has, sol has been solved architecturally in a way.